Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Thank you for your giving. Give it up this morning for our band in that offertory. As you can see, we're nailing and stapling the pictures, the cards to the cross. Pastor Randy, I'm gonna have you carry that cross out into the lobby right now, and we will bring it in at the end of the service. There in the lobby, you can finish if you would, and then be prepared upon my calling at the end of the service to bring it in to this front and center altar area. Give it up again for our praise band as they depart from the stage right now. If you're watching this morning on streaming, maybe you're watching from uh, the West Coast, the East Coast, down in Florida, maybe even on the equator. We have people that notify us around the world that watch these services. I want you to see here via the cameras this faithful, faithful, faithful congregation that has come near and far to church with it being how many degrees outside? What was it? Nine degrees, 10 degrees, four degrees? Maybe it's up to 13 degrees, but you've come to church. And you've come expecting to receive from God. And I believe you will this morning. I know you will. Turn your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 6 within God's Word. And uh, if you have a sermon study guide, you have one unlike any other because it's nothing but scriptures for the main points this morning. How many of you, I'm curious, I'm interested, how many of you uh, lost power? Lost power, raise up your hand high. Okay, I see Will, I see. The Johnsons lost power. Oh my, oh my, yet Keith, yes. How many more over here on my right lost power? Sure, okay, yes, yes. Becky and I lost power in our home uh, that we've owned for 30 years in Shelby Township. We've never had a problem losing power due to a storm or the only time was the, the Northeast blackout. But as far as weather related, never have, never have until Friday night at 7.30. And it didn't come back on, it didn't come back on until Saturday at 4 o'clock. It was the coldest night in our house since our last fight. I mean, I mean, <laughs> your wife, your, your pastor's wife, and my we never ever fight. We have intense fellowship. <laughs> but no, no. In all seriousness, it, it it was it was 59 degrees and under, and my it was miserable miserable and then when the power came back on yesterday at four o'clock i was like a kid in a candy store i never realized how delightful electricity is and how i had taken it for granted how i had taken the power for granted this week this week is all about power i'm talking about prayer power you show me, you show me a prayerless Christian, and I'll show you a powerless Christian. I admonish you, I'm sounding the call as the pastor of this church for a week of prayer by the saints of this church. I'm asking you to come out on Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night for one hour of prayer. I guarantee it, you will be amazed and how quickly that hour goes by. We start with a quick devotion, then we go into praise, then we go into private prayer, then we go into uh, corporate prayer, praying for one another, and the prayer of agreement. Jesus said, if any two or three agree upon any one thing, it shall be done. There's power when we agree together in prayer. It's a partnership of faith. That's why we have church. And we don't stay at home and live out our Christian life. But we need to come together. God has created us to be interdependent. 
to pray with one another and for one another. That's what the week of prayer is all about. We'll have Wednesday night as usual, but we're asking every teacher, every leader of every class or ministry to be able to emphasize prayer and spend uh, at least five minutes with your group in prayer. Amen. Why pray? Why pray? Because our world is sick, and prayer is our only hope. It was prayer that split the Red Sea and made a way where there seemed to be no way. It was prayer that caused rain to fall from the heavens and fire from the skies. It was prayer that shut the mouths of lions and made it cool in the fiery furnace. Prayer has vanquished armies. Prayer has revived nations. Prayer has revived families and individuals. Prayer has changed the destiny, hallelujah, of lives, churches, and nations for the glory of God. Prayer has healed the sick. Prayer has conquered demons. Prayer has raised the dead. Prayer brings power. Prayer is power. It's the most powerful act that you or I could ever perform. That's why a week of prayer is so necessary. The time of prayer is power. The place of prayer is power. The people of prayer are a people of power. You got it. Amen. Will you, will you, will you be a man, a woman, a prayer? Luke chapter 11, verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, when he finished, he was being watched as he prayed. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray. That's my heart's cry for us here at Lakeside. Lord, teach us to pray. The disciples' request shows us something. It shows us that there's a right way and a wrong way to pray. So Jesus taught them the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is not to be formally recited by you as a substitute for your own praying. The Lord's Prayer was meant by Jesus to give us a pattern, to give us a model, to give us a paradigm on how to pray. As we study the Lord's Prayer, we find power in our personal prayer life, power in the church's prayer life. This morning I give you seven revelations from the Lord's Prayer to experience the transforming power of prayer. Are you ready to be able to examine a prayer unlike any other prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Let's dive into it. First of all, after this manner, Jesus said in Matthew 6, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. I want you to notice here, Jesus' first stop, and our first stop in prayer, is the Father. Intimacy with the Father. Do you realize something? You would be hard put to find any prayer in the Old Testament that ever addresses God as Father. In fact, to make it more poignant, our Father. Say it with me. Our Father. Here Jesus, at the first point of praying, establishes the truth. He's our Father. There's intimacy. 
You are not, when you pray, you are not praying to some impersonal Star Wars force. You're not praying to an angry judge. You're not praying to some impersonal deity. You're praying to our Father who desperately loves you and he knows you better than you even know yourself. He is your loving, merciful, caring Father. How do we know this? What did Jesus say? When you have seen me, you have seen the, the Father. Amen. And if God's our Father, what does that make us? <laughs> Think of it. If Jesus is radically revealing for the first time that God is our Father, what does that make us? I, I nudged to my wife in traffic the other day as I took a picture uh, of it. I, I came close to posting it on the screen for you. Here next to us was a Mustang convertible, and a fairly new one. Uh, bad time to be driving a convertible, I'll tell you. And guess what the license plate was? Dum dum. D U M D U M. Dum dum. Dum dum. What license plate has the enemy put on you? What have you allowed others to put on you? What have you allowed your past to put on you? Hmm? Failure? Hmm? Fool? Loser? I want to remind you, Christian, you are not what the world says you are. You're not what others say you are. You're not what your past says you are. You're what God says you are. Hallelujah! As Jesus is in you and, and you are in him, God looks down upon you and says, This is my child in whom I'm well pleased. Think not that you have chosen me. I have chosen you. You are chosen. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a, a, a special holy people, a holy nation that I might call you <laughs> out of darkness into my marvelous light. We're kings and priests. We're heirs of righteousness. You are the child of God. Amen. King's kids. <laughs> Secondly, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed. Be thy name. Is that how you start your prayers? Hallowed be thy name. We're, we are often, often do we find ourselves in the position of starting our prayers with, Help! Here Jesus establishes the fact that you and I should not start our prayers by calling and asking for help with our needs or the needs of others, but that our first focus is worship, praise. I'll be preaching on that next Sunday, the power of praise. But we need to begin our prayer time with praise. Praise always, always, always precedes Petition. Praise should always come before asking. Hallowed means to honor God for His holiness. It means to spend time before you do anything else in prayer. Spend time 
focusing on him, <laughs> praising the Lord for what he has done, thanking him that the electricity is on, <laughs> thanking him for his provision, thanking him for your health, thanking him for family, thanking him for loved ones, thanking him for his blessings, thanking him for the victory. But don't just stop there. If you want to really press into praise and worship, not only praise God for what he has done, praise God for who he is. You're my savior. You're my healer. You're my provider. You're my mighty warrior in the time of battle. You're my comforter in the time of grief. You are the joy of my salvation. Hallelujah to my Jesus. Amen. My Lord, my God. Praise the Lord. Why do we begin our prayer time with worship and praise? Because God needs buttering up? No, because your faith needs building up. Your faith needs building up. Often, often, in our prayer time, we can so focus upon our fears, our anxieties, our worries that we lift up to the Lord, we can so focus on our problems that our problems become bigger than our God. Little Johnny, little Johnny had trouble at school with a bully. And the bully lived right down the street. He walked in fear down the school hallways of the bully. His dad felt so bad for him that uh, dad bought little Johnny uh, his most uh, favorite, favorite uh, gift that he sorely wanted, a pair of binoculars. Because uh, he loved looking at the moon and the stars, the planets at night. Dad came out in the front yard and little Johnny had the binoculars looking down the street. But little Johnny had the binoculars backwards. And he was looking at the bully, the neighbor boy down the street with the backwards binoculars. And dad said to Johnny, Johnny, you've got the binoculars backwards. And Johnny said, no, I don't. As I look at the bully this way, he's a whole lot smaller. And I'm a whole lot bigger. That's what, that's what praise and worship will do. If you'll start your prayer time with praise and worship, I'll, I'll, let me tell you something. You can say with the psalmist, Oh, magnify, magnify, magnify the Lord with me. Praise enlarges who our God is. Worship enlarges His healing capacity, His saving potential, His provision, His victory in your life. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. Praise ye the Lord. And watch what God will do. Amen. You see, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You need your faith ignited right at the beginning of your prayer time. So spend time, spend time, spend time magnifying your Lord instead of magnifying your problems. Magnifying your Lord instead of magnifying your pain. Magnifying your Lord uh, and faith will be ignited in you and you'll move through your prayer time shouting out the victory, claiming the healing, confessing the miraculous for our God. Amen. Amen. Watch what you can do and believe for. As King's kids, Jesus calls us to pray the biggest prayer possible. What is the biggest prayer in the universe? Do you know it? It's right there in Matthew 6, verse 10. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The whole Bible, the whole Bible, the whole purpose of the Bible is summed up in this one verse. All of God's agenda, 
all the purposes of God are summed up in Matthew 6, 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Did you hear that? We're to pray that God's kingdom and will would be established here on earth among the nations as it is in heaven. Kingdom come praying is interceding for souls to be saved, uh, for families to be restored, for revival in our churches, revival in these United States of America, revival in this world. Kingdom come praying is believing for the greatest miracle ever. And God is up to the challenge because we serve a big, big, big God. Amen. Most Christians settle, settle for small, ordinary, low expectation praying. When you settle for those kind of prayers, you make God... You make God a small, ordinary, low-expectation father. And you live a small, ordinary, low-expectation life. But what do we read in Jeremiah? Jeremiah 33, verse 3, Call to me, and I will answer you, saith the Lord, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Listen, just because we're few in number this morning, because of the cold, doesn't mean, doesn't mean you can't bear witness to what the Word of the Lord is saying. Do I, do I, this, will somebody bear witness? We serve a big God. I mean, a really, really, really big God. I'm talking about the God with just a word spoke existence out of non-existence. I'm talking about the creator God who spoke all that there is, the entire universe, into existence. My, 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 we're talking, you know, at one time they thought that there were a billion galaxies. Now they're talking two trillion galaxies. Now they're talking 10 trillion galaxies. Go home and Google it. What's the biggest star? What's the biggest star in the universe? The sun, the North Star. Oh, those things are miniatures compared. A Japanese astronomer discovered the biggest star in the universe. That's why it's got a crazy name. You'll love, you'll love pronouncing the name of the biggest star in the known universe. Ui Scuti. Say it with me. Ui Scuti. You say, how big is Ui Scuti? I'm going to tell you how big. If you, if you were on a commercial jet liner going about how fast do they normally go? Maximum speed when you're traveling, 600 miles an hour. If you were traveling at 600 miles an hour in a commercial jet plane, how long would it take you to circle just once Ui Scuti? It would take you 1,500 years to circle that star just once at 600 miles per hour. We serve a big God. I said, we serve a big God. He's big enough to move your mountains. He's big enough to carry your burdens. He's big enough to conquer your giants. Trust Him. Reverence Him. Honor Him. Praise Him. Go to Him in the time of trial. Amen. Call to me, and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Learn to pray God-sized prayers. Don't settle for small, ordinary, low-expectation prayers. That doesn't honor God. God is saying to you, I spoke. 
the universe into being. So pray God-sized prayers that honor me, that challenge me, that bestow upon me honor for my greatness. For I am able to do that which is exceedingly and abundantly, more than what you can ask, imagine, or think. Ordinary, ordinary, ordinary praying is, God, God, help my kids choose the right friends and get good grades and not watch bad TV shows. But extraordinary, God-sized praying is, God, wash my children with the blood of the Lamb. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Call them into the ministry and create and cause them to be the next Billy Graham for planet Earth. Hallelujah. Many of you, many of you are asking about my 93-year-old father who suffered a stroke which has been confirmed now and is paralyzed on his left side. His left leg, his left uh, arm are, are obscenely swollen like balloons. And he's in a rehabilitation center up in Lapeer. We'll be going there today. And as I anointed him with oil, and laid my hands upon him. <laughs> I prayed <laughs> not that the Lord would just make him comfortable as a 93-year-old in that rehab center. I didn't pray some small, uh, 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 underrated, low-expectation, average, ordinary prayer. I laid my hands upon him, and I said, God... <laughs> 120-year-old Moses, uh, infused with your strength and power, led Israel to the threshold of the promised land. God, uh, Joshua at 110, said before Israel, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And God, Abraham at age 100, you recharged his battery so that he could have a child at age 100. Lord, you did it before. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Amen. Our God is able. Oh, God, do it again. Ask God. Ask God for the impossible. When was the last time you asked God for the impossible? Ask him to divide the seas before you like Moses and make a way where there seems to be no way. Ask him to send fire from the heavens like Elijah did to consume the sacrifice. Ask him uh, to walk with you through life's fiery furnaces uh, as the fourth man in the fire. He, you won't go it alone. God always shows up in the fire. Amen. Ask him uh, for great and mighty things. Ask him to defeat the Goliaths of sin and wickedness that are stalking our land because our God is in the giant killing business. Ask, 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 for he's our God who cannot and will not fail us. Fourthly, Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Now, I want you to notice something. Notice the juxtaposition here. Notice the extremes. On one hand, Jesus says, you need to pray, thy kingdom come. And then he immediately, the next, he says, also pray, give us this day our daily bread. Do you see the extreme contrast? From the macro universe to the micro universe, God is able. Amen. Think of what that reveals. Our he heavenly Father, our great mighty God, is not only able to handle the big victories, the big miracles, the big kingdom things, he also cares about the tiniest details 
and needs of your life and my life. He cares about the closest parking space to the store when it's freezing cold. Ask. Ask. Pray. Give us this day our daily bread. God cares about the tiniest details of your life and my life. He knows the number of hairs upon your head. He cares about your, your tiny needs. There is no need that is too small to bring to our God right down to what you eat. Give us this day our daily bread. All we have to do is ask. 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 I love to tell the story of the old widow that would get out on her front porch every morning and she would stand there and as the birds would sing in the morning, she would shout out, Hallelujah! This is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. But she would hear a voice shout from the bushes, there is no God. Atheists live next door. And that woman's praise and worship each morning infuriated him. Then he heard that the old widow had fallen on bad times and was without food, groceries, provisions. And so he thought, I'm going to pull one on her. He went out and bought bags of groceries, household supplies, all the necessities that you'd find at the store. And he put the bags on her porch so that she would find the bags of groceries in the morning. And then he'd pop out of the bushes and say, God didn't give you those. I did. There is no God. Sure enough, she came out at her usual routine time to praise the Lord in the morning. She saw the bags of groceries, the household, household necessities. She lifted up her hands and said, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will really rejoice and be glad for it. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for this provision. The atheist jumped out of the bushes. Ha! God didn't give you those things. I went out and bought them. She lifted her hands even higher. God, I thank you that you not only provided for my need, but you made the devil pay for it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. Asking. Asking. Asking is the rule of the kingdom. Asking, it shows dependency on the Lord. When you ask, you're showing that God is your source. You just did that in tithing this morning. I feel bad for people that don't tithe. I feel bad for people that don't tithe. Don't give assent to the work of God. You know what they're saying? They're saying... God is not my source. My job is my source. The bank is my source. Wall Street is my source. God is not my source. When you gave this morning, you are saying, Lord, I'm stepping out of the boat <laughs> to walk upon the miraculous. Lord, I obey you. I trust you. I declare that my source is not Wall Street. It's not Madison Avenue. It's not my job. My source is you. <laughs> and I trust you to make a way where there seems to be no way. I'm asking. I'm dependent upon you. Don't you love reading the genealogies in the Bible? I'm talking about the begats. For those of you that have read through the Bible, all of a sudden you come to a chapter in the Bible and uh, uh, so-and-so is the son of, and, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. In First Chronicles, there are over 500 names in the genealogies, yet there's one name, one name, one name that God pushes the pause button. Thank you for preaching my sermon. <laughs> 
Jabez. No, I like that. That's good engagement. Jabez. God stops. And what does God say in 1 Chronicles 4.10? Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. Why is God so delighted with our asking? He can already read our minds. He already knows what we need. Why is God so honored and delighted by our asking? Yesterday, yesterday, I got a call when it was so, so cold, and I I'm trying to shovel the driveway and breaking the ice with a pick. I mean, it was terrible. That was the worst shoveling I've ever done. And talk about losing power. It's been a weekend of it. My snow thrower broke down as well. Powerless. That's another sermon right there. All of a sudden, I get a phone call. Dad! Our child, our daughter, who's moved out of the house and we're empty nesters for the first time. Dad! I've tried an ice scraper, but the ice scraper just isn't working on the windshield of my car. I, I, how am I going to get this ice off the windshield of my car? I said, just get a bucket of really hot water and... Throw it on there. Better yet, go out and buy yourself a gallon of de-icer for the future. Wow! I never thought of that. Wow, thank you so much, Dad. I hung up and I felt like a million dollars. <laughs> oh, I felt like the answer man. I'm needed. I'm still wanted. She's still depending on me. She thinks I'm smart. <laughs> hey, if I am sensing that, if I'm experiencing that, can you imagine what our Heavenly Father, huh? Imagine what He feels when you say, Lord, uh, I'm leaning on Your everlasting arms. I need Your guidance. I need Your direction. I need answers from Your throne, Lord. I need Your strength. I need Your touch. Uh, go before me and come behind me. When Jesus encountered blind Bartimaeus, do you remember what Jesus asked? Blind Bartimaeus comes to Jesus. And Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? I can imagine Peter, James, and John standing to the side and going, Duh! Jesus, he's blind! But Jesus purposely, even though he knew exactly what Bartimaeus needed, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus cried out, I want to see. That's all that your heavenly Father needs to hear. What's your need What's your desire? What's your urgency? What's your plea? What's your request? It shows not just dependency. It shows God confidence. I know that if I bring my petitions, my needs unto him, that he'll make a way where there seems to be no way. James chapter 4, verse 2. You have not because, 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 because... You ask not. Asking is the rule of the kingdom. No need is too small. What are your needs? What are your needs? Ask. Cry out to God. Try tears. Get desperate for God to move your mountain. Is that scriptural pastor to cry? Is that scriptural to try tears, Pastor? Jesus did it. Look what the Bible says about Jesus. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears. 
to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Don't pray mealy-mouthed, uh, uh, you know, bedtime prayers. Oh, God! Get passionate. Get urgent. Get desperate for God to move in your situation. Why? Jesus did. Jesus did. Follow his example. Too many Christians miss out on God's best in their lives simply because they never ask. But Pastor Phil, God helps those who help themselves. It's not found in the Bible. You'll never find it in the Word of God. That comes from the world. But asking is found in the Bible. Lord, teach us to ask. Next, Jesus says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here Jesus reveals two reasons why some prayers aren't answered. Maybe this could be why your prayers are not being answered. Number one, God can't receive prayers from unsanctified lives where there's unconfessed sin. The psalmist put it this way, Psalms 60. Six, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. We had just purchased a brand new appliance. I'm reading the instructions, and I'm trying to put this gizmo together, trying to get it to work. It wouldn't work. I'm getting frustrated. And Becky leans over, walks in the room, and says, Did you plug it in? Did you plug it in? Nope. Nope. Sin, unconfessed sin, and your prayer life don't mix. God cannot have intimacy with a life that is holding on to unconfessed sin. The psalmist said, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Unconfessed sin separates us from God's power. It short circuits uh, His best for our lives. Always remember, there's two continuals. There's two continuals in the gospel. What are the two continuals in the gospel? First John. First John. Look at First John one eight. If we claim we have no sin. We are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But there's hope. Here's the second continual, 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Start your prayer time by asking God to forgive you of every sin, both known and unknown sin. Here's the second reason why prayers are not answered. Here's the second reason why prayers are are not answered. God cannot hear prayers from unforgiving hearts. God's forgiveness of our sins is totally contingent upon our forgiveness of one another. God will not allow vertical praying that ignores horizontal relationships. Do you see that? Our prayer power is totally contingent upon our forgiveness of one another. Years ago, I asked one of my children, I said, what is your greatest fear? What is your greatest fear? And my child immediately put their hand to their head pulled back their hair and said that I would look like my father, a bald eagle. <laughs> God is our father. And our God will not have children that do not look or act like himself. 
Our God is infinite love, infinite grace, infinite mercy. And if His child is not like that, if you are not godly like our Lord, He cannot have relationship with you. He cannot forgive your sins. Sometimes people theologically have a problem with me because they think that there's only one unpardonable sin. I'm going to tell you something. There's another one. Unforgiveness. God cannot forgive you if you choose not to be forgiving with others. So if you want power in prayer, if you want your prayers answered, confess your sins and walk in a spirit of forgiveness and watch the answer come. Next, Jesus said, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, in the King James Version, the formalistic prayer, the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. But the modern translation puts it and, and translates it correctly. Deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from who? Satan. Satan. Here Jesus reveals that real prayer, real prayer, if you are engaged in real prayer, you will engage the unseen foe. Real prayer is prayer warfare. Real prayer acknowledges that there's a third partner in this prayer time, in this prayer situation. The third partner, number one, is God. Number two is you. Number three is the enemy. When you pray, the enemy will do his best to keep you from praying, keep you from power in prayer, because prayer, is the mightiest weapon that we have in our hands. Prayer is the only God-ordained method for invading the spiritual dimension and assaulting the gates of hell. God has given you prayer for prayer warfare. Use it and don't lose it. Satan, what can we say about him? I want to serve you notice Satan is real. And some are fighting a very real Satan in their marriages, in their lives, in their homes, in their workplaces, in their ministries. Satan is the most powerful created being of God's universe. Satan defeated the wisest man, Solomon. Satan defeated the strongest man, Samson. Satan defeated a man who walked with Jesus for three years, and his name is Judas. Don't say, don't say that you can't be fooled by him. You cannot be defeated by him. Our only hope in dealing with the enemy is prayer <laughs> in that name which is above every other name. And what name is that? The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Yes, Satan has unimaginable power, but he has no authority. There's only one who has all authority in heaven and in earth, and his name is Jesus, leaving Satan, zip, zero, nada, zilch. When we move in the name of Jesus, when we move in his authority, mountains move, strongholds are pulled down. He makes a way where there seems to be no way. His light invades the darkness. Say the name Michael Jordan and you think of what? Basketball. Say the name Einstein and what do you think of? Science. Say the name Shakespeare. Literature. Say the name Elon Musk or, 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 or Jeff Bezos and you think of unbelievable, unimaginable wealth. Say the name Jesus. And you think of power. Power in prayer. Now, the enemy will do his best to hinder your prayer life. His greatest weapon in your prayer life and my prayer life is to bring up the past, to dredge up the past, and to tell you you're guilty, you're condemned. 
God doesn't love you. You're unworthy. Your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling because you've been such a bad boy. You've been such a bad girl. And that's why Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. But Revelation 12, 11 reveals how we can overcome every work of the enemy and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. This is vital. This is vital. This is vital when you're praying for your loved ones. Just as those old Israel fathers applied the blood of the sacrificial lamb upon the doorways of the homes in which their families resided, and it kept out, it kept out the destroyer. It protected their loved ones from the destroyer. You and I need to plead the blood in prayer uh, over our loved ones, over our sons and our daughters, our fathers, our mothers. If lamb's blood, if ordinary lamb's blood could nullify uh, and defeat the work of the enemy, how much more the blood of Jesus that will never, ever lose its power. Imagine the victory that we have. We're going to bring that cross back up here this morning. You're going to see the names of unsaved, unbelieving loved ones. You're going to see their faces on that cross. Uh, imagine with me the power that we have when we plead the blood of Jesus upon them, when we declare in prayer, Satan! The blood of Jesus is against you. I claim my loved one through the power of the cross of Calvary. You have no authority in my son's life. You have no authority in my daughter's life. They were created. They were fashioned for the presence of the Lord. And Jesus has all authority in this place. Amen. Amen. All authority, not some authority. Lastly, Jesus told us to pray this. For thine, say it with me, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What does amen mean? It is done. <laughs> we leave our prayer time with holy God confidence. It cannot be otherwise. It is done. I want you to notice we began our prayer time with praise and we end our, our prayer time with praise. Don't look at the circumstances. Your loved one might still be sick after you prayed. Despite, despite the unchanged circumstances, Victory is assured. One way or another, victory is assured. There's power in the Word. There's power in the Spirit. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my Spirit, saith the Lord. There's power in the name of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus will never, ever lose its power. Amen. Plus, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, it doesn't end in a whimper. It ends in a roar. Thine is the kingdom. There's no other recourse. You win. We're on the winning side. There's no sense following a loser. His is the kingdom. So when you witness, when you witness a sick America, you need to pray, Thy kingdom come when you witness lawlessness abounding in our land i'm talking about our bleeding borders with illegal immigration laws on the books that are not being enforced when you see shoplifting in our retail stores amounting to billions of dollars when you see our law enforcement, men and women being assassinated on the streets of America. Last year was a record high number of police officers killed on the streets of America. When you see these things, pray thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. When you see Michigan Governor Whitmer 
cheering like she did in last February, the repeal of Michigan's abortion ban that has put us on the same footing as communist China and North Korea, lift up your hands and begin to pray, the kingdom come. When you see massive marches take place this weekend along with uh, the squad in Congress protesting Israel's very right to existence despite the brutal, unspeakable atrocities committed by Hamas, the most Jews killed since the Nazi Holocaust. And yet, uh, yet, uh, they don't even want Israel to exist. You talk about genocide. When you see these things, begin to pray, the kingdom come. When you see your children growing up in a perverse abomination of America, a culture that says gay is okay, same-sex marriage is okay, drag queens hosting library Bible story hours is okay, or if they want to identify uh, uh, boys as girls and girls as boys, or even as cats and animals, that's okay. That's when we need to pray as a church. Say it with me. The kingdom come. What's the answer? What's the answer? The answer is not in more legislation or more education. It's not in more police, prisons, or Prozac, or even presidential candidates. The answer is, and it's always been, uh, thy kingdom come to you, to you who are weary of the crime and the perversion and antichrist culture that our children and our grandchildren are growing up in. Keep praying, thy kingdom come to the atheists, to the abortionists, to the secular humanists, to the very demonic terrorists of hell. We put you on notice. Uh, there's still a holy remnant. There's still a born again, blood washed, Bible believing remnant that is still praying, the kingdom come. Plus remember, there's no kingdom without a king. I said there's no kingdom without a king. Next time he comes back, uh, it's not to be laid in a manger. It's not to ride a donkey or wa wash dirty feet. Uh, he's not coming back to be beaten, whipped, cursed, or crucified. Uh, he's not coming back to wear a crown of thorns. No, next time he comes, he's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. What a day, what a day, though what a day that will be when our Jesus we shall see when he walks uh, into the halls of Congress, when he walks into the Senate chamber, when he walks in the Oval Office, the White House itself, and says, I don't need Air Force One. I've got a white stallion uh, that thunders through the clouds. Uh, I don't need, uh, I don't need to worry about my age. I don't need to worry about my memory. I don't need to worry about my reasoning since I'm post 80. Uh, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not worried. I'm not worried about the polls. I'm not worried about the primaries. I'm not running for election. I am your king of kings. I am your Lord of lords. Uh, how, how, I ask you, will this take place? It'll be an answer for a church that is faithfully praying, thy kingdom come. Would you stand with me this morning?